Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinato. I'll be the moderator of today's session. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few logistics. First of all, I'm very pleased to say that we have extended our virtual Research in Action series through the end of the year. You can find all interesting and exciting topics that will be presented on our website, Research in Action. Today's um, seminar will not allow you to ask uh, questions online, questions uh, via audio, but we would like to address your questions. So if you hover your mouse in the bottom of your screen, you do see, do see a question and answer button there, Q and A button. If you push that button, a pop-up will come up and you can type your question there. You can type your question at any time during the presentation. We will address your questions at the end of the presentation. If we do not get to your question in the allotted time, we will ask our presenter to answer those questions offline and they will be posted together with a recording of today's presentation on our research and action website at Florida Atlantic University. With that, it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Raquel, Raquel Assis. Dr. Raquel Assis is uh, a, a researcher at Florida Atlantic University, where she came from Penn State University. She received her PhD at the University of Michigan and did her postdoc experience at UC Berkeley. Her experience is machine learning and statistics applied to genomic data to determine their uh, functionality and their evolutionary relationships. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Assis. Enjoy the presentation. Hello. Thank you, Karen, um, for the really nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Um, so the title of today's talk is Unzip Your Genes to Reveal the Past and the Future. And I just wanted to, before I started, I just wanted to reference um, my two affiliations here at FAU, um, the Department of Computer and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and the Institute for Human Health and Disease Intervention. And I wanted to reference those just because I want to mention that the reason I'm affiliated with both is because my research, um, my group's research is highly interdisciplinary in that we use uh, methods and concepts from computer science to design new approaches so that we can study genomic data and answer questions about both evolution and disease. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. So what I'll start out doing is give you a little bit of an introduction to genetics and where it's going. And then I will tell you a little bit about um, where my, uh, my group's work is going. So um, uh, you may be wondering, what are genes? Well, genes are our basic functional units. We all have them, and we can't live without them. So here's a uh, picture of a human body. And as we all know, um, we, have, uh, we have lots of different organs in our body, all very complex organs. Um, we have our skin, which is the largest organ. It covers our entire exterior. We have a heart. We have uh, a liver. We have lungs, and so on. So we have lots of these complex organs. And if you take a microscope and you zoom in on those organs, you'll see layers that we call tissues. If you zoom in on those on the microscope, you'll see um, millions of cells. And if you zoom into those cells and you look inside of them, you'll see uh, these structures that are called chromosomes. So humans have 46 chromosomes in e each one of our cells in our body, 23 from our father, 23 from our mother. And each of those chromosomes has a long strand of DNA. Um, so this DNA is a, a double-stranded molecule. It's a helix. Um, and it's formed from uh, four bases that are denoted by letters A, T, C, and G. And these bases form pairs with one another in this double helix. So A and T form pairs, and C and G uh, form pairs. And those are called base pairs. And you, if you count up all of the base pairs, in the human genome across all of the different chromosomes, you'll see that there's over 3 billion of them. So it's quite large. And if you segment the DNA, um, the entire genome, uh, you, you segment the DNA of the entire genome, you'll see that there are these regions that we call genes. 
And these are our basic functional units um, that do the things uh, that, that give us functionality in our organs. And so um, how do they do that? Well, genes control many of our traits. Um, this is just a simple example. It's a piece of a chromosome. And each of these bands, the blue and the pink, represent um, genes that are located on that chromosome. So in this, um, this top blue band um, denotes an eye color gene. Um, and it, it controls eye color. In this, um, in this example, it's brown. And this bottom band in pink denotes the hair color gene. It controls hair color. In this case, it's blonde. And what's interesting about both of these particular genes that I've chosen to show you is that they both control the amount of a pigment called melanin that's present in both eyes and in hair. And the more melanin you have in these, in these organs, um, the darker the color will be. So for example, brown eyes have a lot of melanin, whereas blonde hair has very little melanin. Unfortunately, though, um, what I just told you is a really nice story, but a, lot of, a large proportion of gene functions are completely unknown. So this is a figure, a pie chart, um, from after the human genome was sequenced back in 2001. And unfortunately, not much has changed since then. Um, we, you can see that a very large proportion of gene functions are known. However, um, another large proportion, about 42%, um, are completely unknown. So we do not know what these genes are doing. And so this is a major question in genetics. What are these uh, genes doing and how do they contribute to our evolution and to our uh, diseases that we observe? And to understand that, what we need to do is think about how um, these functions are conferred by genes. And so the way that they, uh, um, the functional units in our cells are actually called proteins. They're these three-dimensional molecules. Um, and they're actually coded for, or um, the formula or recipe for them is given by this DNA. But in order to make that protein, it's a very complex process that involves uh, two very uh, complicated steps. The first is called transcription, where that double-stranded DNA helix is transcribed into a single-stranded RNA molecule. And the second step is called translation, where that RNA sequence is translated into a protein. And actually what happens is it's, this starts, this protein starts out as a linear molecule and then it folds into this um, nice uh, uh, structure, this conformation that allows it to go around and, and do perform specific functions in the cell, such as increasing perhaps the melanin production in your eyes. Now what's also interesting is that as we all know, we're constantly losing old cells. So you're constantly losing old hair, old skin cells, and the same is true for all of the organs in your body. We're constantly losing the old cells and replenishing them with new cells. And because of that, we also need to make more DNA that goes into those cells. So this DNA is constantly copying each other or it's itself or undergoing a process called replication. Now, um, because it's constantly copying itself, um, mistakes can occur. So mistakes during replication can introduce what are called mutations. So on the left here is um, a schematic of a normal gene, which produces a normal protein. And you can see on the right here, there's a mutation in this gene. It's a mutated gene. Um, this base pair now has been broken. So perhaps um, these bases were A and T, which bind together. They pair with one another. And now um, there is a mutation, and this is a C. So it can no longer bind or pair with that A. And so now once this mutation occurs, um, the protein that's produced may be abnormal or it may not exist at all. So, um, and, and this, uh, the outcome of a mutation is highly dependent on the type of mutation that occurred, where it occurred in the gene, and also the genetic context in which it arose. And so there's lots of different um, outcomes of mutations. And you may automatically um, think of a mutation as something bad. I think most of us do. When we hear mutation, we think that it's harmful. Um, but actually, mutations can have a whole range of effects. Um, they can be neutral or have no effect at all on function. They can be beneficial or have a positive effect on function. Or they can ha be harmful, have a negative effect on function. And so here are some examples of each. Um, for a neutral mutation, um, the, a mutation about 10,000 years ago in the HERC2 gene, 
actually caused blue eyes to arise. Um, before about 10,000 years ago, um, all individuals had either brown or green eyes. And then after this mutation, um, we had individuals who had blue eyes. And as you can imagine, this is neutral um, because it has no effect on function. So it doesn't, um, it's not beneficial. It doesn't allow you to see better. It's not harmful. It's, so it's uh, a neutral mutation. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a, a beneficial mutation that's quite common in humans. It's a mutation in what's called the CCR5 gene, and it confers HIV resistance. Um, so it prevents you from getting HIV. And the way it does this is that um, individuals with the normal copy of the CCR5 gene without the mutation have this left um, scenario. Their cells have a membrane, so this exterior here, that has a, a CCR5 protein in it. Um, so you can see embedded in this membrane are several uh, uh, red loops. Those are the CCR5 proteins. Um, and HIV binds to that protein, and essentially that's the doorway for HIV to get into your cell. Now, in uh, individuals with this mutation in the CCR5 gene, they do not have the CCR5 protein on their membranes of their cells, and so HIV has no way to get into their cells, and so it gives them HIV resistance. And then finally, um, you can probably think of lots of these types of mutations that you've heard about. Um, this is a particularly common one um, in the TP53 gene. Um, this is a gene that, can, that uh, produces a protein that controls cell growth. And because of that, mutations in this gene can often lead to many different types of cancers. And so um, here's an example of uh, what happens during cancer. During cancer, um, there is an overproliferation of cells. You can see that in blue. Those are the cancer cells, whereas the normal cells are in red. So um, as I said earlier, when uh, we lose old cells, we replenish them with new cells. However, in cancer, what happens is that the old cells are not dying, and so there is um, an accumulation of these cells. And so mutations can have a, a wide range of effect. And these uh, genes and their underlying mutations are, uh, are passed from parents onto their offspring. So um, for example, you may notice that um, parents often look like their kids, um, and that's because of that. However, there's, uh, not, there's, there is not a direct transfer between uh, traits from parents to offspring, as you'll also often notice. So for example, um, if both parents have brown eyes, it's also possible um, there's a 19% chance that their child will have blue eyes, 7% chance that their, their child will have green eyes. And so this is because um, the traits are not directly passed on, but rather the genes and their underlying mutations. Um, what's nice about this heritability, though, is due to it, we can trace these mutations over time. So this is a very common, um, this is a very common technique in genetics called pedigree analysis, we, where we take a family and we look at their underlying mutations, we trace them over time. Um, and you can see here that this is a mutation um, uh, that the father has, um, and he also displays a trait for this mutation. This is a case of a disease. It's on his X chromosome. So males have um, two, uh, sex, so these are sex chromosomes. Males have an X and a Y, whereas females have XX. Um, so the male has this uh, single uh, affected, this, this single mutation, and he's affected by this mutation. The mother does not have that mutation. She has two normal copies of her X. And because each, um, each parent um, gives one of their children, each of their uh, children, one copy of these chromosomes, it turns out that none of their children will be affected. Um, and so these two girls will end up being carriers of that mutation. They'll have that mutation um, in, in their genetic makeup. However, they won't um, display that, that trait, that disease. And so we can do this type of pedigree analysis to understand how different types of traits, including disease-causing traits, are passed on over time through families. Um, what we can also do is um, we can use these mutations um, to infer ancestry. So for example, this is what 23andMe and uh, Ancestry.com do. They take your DNA and they compare it to the DNA of all of the other individuals in their database to try to infer relationships. 
And so you may have found some of your uh, long lost uh, family members on 23andMe or Ancestry.com, and that's essentially what they're doing. Um, so we can infer ancestry or relationships that are a little more long-term across populations. Um, and moreover, we can go back even further in time. We can go back millions of years and we can infer evolutionary history. We can understand um, what types of mutations occurred after humans diverged um, from um, other, um, their other ancestors. Um, what I'm really interested in in my group uh, most recently is trying to figure out how we can assay what genes are actually doing. And one thing we can do is look um, at uh, mutational footprints that are left behind in the genome to assay gene importance. So how functionally important is a gene? Um, so for example, for a neutral mutation, which has no effect, these mutations are going to be steady over time. They're going to increase and decrease over time at a steady rate. Um, therefore, they're going to lead to an average level of genetic change. And so if we see genes or regions in our genomes uh, that have average genetic change over time, we can infer that those are unimportant. They're functionally unimportant regions of our genomes. On the other hand, um, a beneficial mutation has a positive effect on function. And because of that, that beneficial mutation, those beneficial mutations will increase over time. Um, so if you see more genetic change um, in a particular region of the genome or in a gene um, than average, so if you see more change than on average, then you can infer that that particular region or that particular gene is adaptive. It confers some kind of um, benefit functionally. And then finally, the last footprint is due to a harmful mutation, which of course is uh, harmful to function. Therefore, these types of mutations will tend to decrease over time, leading to less genetic change. So if you see a region of the genome or a gene that has less genetic change than average, you can infer that perhaps that gene is related to some kind of disease. And so we can use these mutational footprints, these specific mutational footprints to act, um, actually determine how functionally important a gene or even a genomic region is. And so here's a very um, nice example um, from the Thousand Genomes Project Consortium. Um, it, it shows um, the 22 uh, human chromosomes that are not sex chromosomes. Remember, we have X and Y as well. So um, you can see here that uh, these uh, are shaded by the amount of genetic change, so the number of mutations, essentially. Um, the red shading means there's more mutations. Blue shading means there's fewer mutations in that region. And if you look at chromosome 6 here, what I've circled, you can see that there's a large red region. Um, so this is a high density of mutations that's occurring. And if you zoom in on that region, you'll see that it's composed of several genes. So there's a lot of genes over here. And what's nice about that is that they're all related to immunity. It's a cluster of genes. It's all related to immunity. And um, this is a signal or a footprint of adaptation um, because these immunity genes are responsible for fighting off novel pathogens. So for example, the novel coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, fighting off that novel pathogen requires that we have a lot of genetic variation in these immunity genes. And so these are helpful for when we encounter um, these new pathogens. Um, what's also interesting is that um, uh, beyond just inferring uh, gene, uh, gene importance, we can start to understand gene function. Um, and so we can do this in a lot of different ways. Um, many of these exper are experiments uh, that require looking at individual genes and individual proteins. However, we can also do this on a genome-wide scale, so across the entire genome. Um, so uh, we all know that we can sequence our DNA. Well, it turns out we can also sequence our RNA. So remember that DNA must be transcribed into RNA before it's made into a protein. Now, what's nice about sequencing this RNA is it's telling you how active um, how much activity a particular gene has in a particular uh, tissue or organ. So, um, for example, um, if we look at the brain, the heart, and the liver, these are extremely uh, diverse organs. They have very different functions. Um, and as I told you earlier, all of our cells in our body contain the exact same DNA, 
which means that they have the, they produce the exact same proteins. Um, so how is it possible that these three organs function so differently when they contain the exact same uh, genetic makeup? Well, it turns out that um, in order for a gene to be active, it needs to first be converted into RNA, and then afterward it's, con it's converted into a protein. And uh, genes are active um, in different proportions across different tissues over time. So um, the way that uh, an organ, organs have different functions is that they have different genes that are active at different times. Um, and so by looking at gene activity in, um, and comparing it across organs, we can start to infer what a gene is doing. Um, so for example, suppose we sequence all of the RNA um, of a particular gene in the brain, the heart, and the liver, and then we measure how much RNA is in each. Um, each organ. You can see in this example, we have a little bit of uh, RNA from that gene in the liver, a little bit more in the heart, and about double in the brain tissue. And so based on the activity level of that gene, we might infer that that particular gene has a, um, an important role in brain function. And so we can do this type of analysis to get a large scale understanding of what different genes are doing um, in the different tissues, um, if we sequence many different tissues, um, as well as over time, if we, for example, sequence different developmental stages. So um, we sequence babies, uh, we sequence um, adults of different ages, we can understand more about what a gene is doing based on that activity. So here's an example of what my group uh, recently did um, with this type of analysis. Um, what we did is we compared three human populations, um, a Finnish population from Finland, um, and then populations from the UK and from Italy. Um, we looked at RNA sequencing data to study gene activity across the genome, so across all genes in the genome, um, in these three populations in their, blood uh, in their blood cells. And what we found is that we found a really elevated level of gene activity in a, the vitamin D receptor gene only in uh, the Finnish population, but not in the other two populations. So this is the top gene that stood out to us. It had the highest level of activity in this population, and it had very little activity in the other two populations. So a vitamin D receptor gene is involved in vitamin D circulation in our body. Um, as we've been starting to understand more and more about, vitamin D is important for lots of our different organs and lots of our different um, biological functions, um, including immunity. And as we also have been starting to learn, most of the vitamin uh, D that we get comes from uh, uh, being exposed to the sun. So about 80% of the vitamin D that we produce is as a result of um, our skin being exposed to UVB rays from the sun. And what happens is the UVB rays hit our skin um, and then uh, we have inactive forms of vitamin D in our body. So they're not able to go around and do anything, um, but they're activated. So they're converted into an activated form of vitamin D. In order to be circulated in the body, body they have to find the protein um, that's encoded by, by the BDR gene, the vitamin D receptor gene. So they find that a receptor in the body. They, the vitamin D uh, binds to the BDR receptor, and only once it's bound is it then allowed to circulate throughout the body and go to the different um, tissues and organs that need it. And so. Um, both VDR and vitamin D are required for this process. And so um, what, we also, um, uh, what we also found out um, was that uh, from previous studies is that latitude is extremely important in vitamin D production because the higher the latitude, the less sunlight and the, less, uh, the lower the UVB rays are. And so um, it's interesting that Finland is located at a much higher latitude than the UK or Italy. And this led us to hypothesize that perhaps this VDR receptor is more active in the Finnish population because it's, um, it's some kind of adaptation to prevent vitamin, uh, um, vitamin D deficiency in this Finnish population. And so this is just an example of how we can use this very uh, large uh, study um, looking across all genes in the genome, looking at RNA sequencing data to understand the gene activities 
um, and to generate these new hypotheses that can later be tested um, uh, in specific experiments. Um, however, what we really want to do is be able to combine different types of data. So I told you about genetic sequence data and about RNA sequencing data, the gene activity data. And what we really want to do is be able to combine those two different types of data as well as, as data from other experiments that I didn't talk about today. Um, so there's a lot of data that has been generated over the past uh, 20 to 30 years. But there are numer numerous obstacles. So for one, there's a lot of data, like I just said, um, uh, there's over 3 billion uh, base pairs of DNA in each one of our cells. Um, if, and uh, this is just a single human, if we are going to sequence many humans across uh, different populations or many species, um, and, and if we're gonna get different types of data as well, like gene activity data, RNA sequencing data, and other experimental data I didn't even talk about, that, that's a lot of data. Um, there's also different data sources. Like I just said, um, how do we recon reconcile different types of measurements? So DNA sequencing uh, produces different types of measurements um, than RNA sequencing data and then other types of data that we can generate. And another uh, obstacle is that we have incomplete knowledge still. We don't know uh, what, how important different types of data are. Um, how important is the sequence versus the activity across tissues in understanding gene function and understanding whether it causes um, adaptation or disease? We really don't know that. And then finally, um, the last point that I wanted to make, although there are numerous other obstacles, is that often these signals of events, of, of these past evolutionary events, are very conflicting or even eroded by time. So uh, what I mean by conflicting is that suppose you have a mutation, uh, a, a beneficial mutation that hits a region of the genome. And then right after that, or maybe even some period of time later, um, another mutation hits that same region, either next to it, nearby, or right on top of it. What you're gonna have is a bunch of conflicting signals. And over time, what you're gonna have is an erosion and those footprints are gonna get smaller and smaller. And so how do we resolve uh, those types of issues? Um, well, a promising solution to this problem that we've been using in my group is called machine learning. And machine learning is a subfield of computer science um, and it's actually tailored for these uh, very complicated problems. It's tailored to make predictions from large and complex data. Um, and those data can often have very conflicting signals. So here's just a, a, a figure um, showing all of, uh, or many of the different applications of machine learning that you may be familiar with. Um, so for example, image recognition. So facial recognition uses um, concepts from machine learning, self-driving cars, stock market trading, uh, fraud detection and spam detection, spam filtering, um, and even product recommendations. So when you go on Amazon and, and you look at some products and you put them in your car, Amazon makes recommendations to you. And those are often based on learning about your behavior. Um, so using machine learning co concepts to learn about your behavior and make those recommendations. So how does it work exactly? Um, well, what's nice about this is that it's, it's pretty easy to explain using a simple example. Uh, machine learning methods, what they all do is they're making predictions um, by extracting features from the data and then uh, making predictions from those features. So here's a very simple example on classifying different types of fruit. Um, so suppose you have a basket of fruit and it contains uh, red apples, some red apples, um, some oranges, and some bananas. Um, what you can do is you can take um, all of those fruits and you can, can extract all of their uh, possible features. So here are just three examples of the features we can extract, though there, there are clearly many more that you can think of. Um, so the first feature I have here is shape. Um, and this apple is round, the orange is orange, and a banana is long. Color, um, this is a red apple, so suppose we only have red apples. Apple is red, orange is orange, and uh, banana is yellow. And finally, texture. An apple is smooth, an orange is bumpy, and a banana is also smooth. 
And so by extracting all of these features from our fruits, um, we can learn about them and we can, we can build this classifier, this, this method that's a classifier. So now that once, we're, once we encounter a new fruit, if somebody gives us another fruit to put in our basket, um, we can use the information that uh, we used uh, to build this classifier to classify the new fruit as either an apple, an orange, or a banana. So this is the general idea uh, behind uh, using machine learning um, to make predictions. And what's nice about it is that it's, like I just said, it's been applied to many different fields, lots of diverse fields. And it's very, um, it's very recently started to become popular in the field of work that um, my research group does, um, which is biology and genetics. And so just to give you a little bit of insight into what specifically we're doing, what we're using machine learning for, um, this is a future direction of my research group where we're headed. Um, what we would like to do, and we've been starting to do, is to use these concepts that I just told you about to design machine learning approaches that combine different types of data, so the genetic sequence data, um, the, uh, trait, uh, the uh, activity data from RNA sequencing, and other types of data that I didn't mention today, um, to infer these gene functions, as well as their roles in adaptation and disease. And so here's just a schematic of what I mean by that. Um, the first step of this type of analysis is to extract features from data. So we obtain data, let's say um, a phylogenetic tree showing the relationships among a bunch of species and their genome sequences, so all of uh, their DNA and the genes that are colored in, in different colors here. Um, and then we can extract different features. We can get their uh, sequences, the sequences of these genes, and we can um, get features like uh, the mutational footprints that I told you about, look at uh, rates of change over, over time along this phy phylogeny. We can also get gene activity data, so RNA sequencing data for several tissues or several developmental time points, and then we can, uh, we can also uh, construct other features and extract those um, from those types of data. So we can extract lots of different types of features from our data, we can use those features to um, build models. Um, so build models to study uh, how uh, gene functions um, or gene sequences are changing over time. Um, and also we can uh, fit those models. And the end goal of that is to make some predictions, in particular to make predictions about gene function and also to understand whether those gene functions are adaptive or, or disease related. And so um, this is, uh, like I said, where we're taking, uh, my, my group is currently taking our research um, to design these different types of approaches um, using uh, powerful machine learning concepts to combine very complex, very large and complex data and infer, um, infer gene functions and then also determine what their roles are in both our evolutionary history, adaptation and our, our medical future disease. Um, and so um, for this uh, talk, I just want to acknowledge uh, first um, my previous PhD student, Dr. Sh uh, Sharon Jiang. Um, Dr. Jiang was in my group for about five years. Um, she just graduated this past December, and she did um, some of the work that I showed you on uh, the vitamin uh, D activity in the uh, three European populations. Um, she's also uh, currently a bioinformatics scientist at uh, Thermo Fisher. I also want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for uh, their funding um, for some of the work that I discussed today. Um, thank you for listening, and I'll, I can take any questions. Great. Thank you, Raquel. And just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, please push the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen and type your questions, and we will go through as many questions as we can in the remainder of the time. Um, Raquel, you mentioned um, that uh, a little while back that uh, a mutation that had the uh, higher melanin containing brown eyes mutated to blue eyes. Um, you mentioned then that that occurred about 10,000 years ago. And the question is, how do you know that that was actually 10,000 years ago? And how do you determine that? So, um, so just like, uh, so, so uh, one of the slides that I showed, um, Am I, should I share it again? Or 
I can I can share it again. Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, so this is the type of analysis. Remember I said we can infer ancestry. We can also trace back those mutations over time. So uh, the more, so, so we can look at uh, different populations, different human populations, for example, and, um, and we can trace back those mutations and we can understand um, when different types of traits arose. So we know the gene that controls eye color in this case. Um, in many cases, we don't know which genes control which, uh, which biological traits. So this is not necessarily a very easy task. But in this case, we know the HERC2 gene is responsible for eye color. And so we're able to trace back mutations in that gene over time and identify when that mutation arose that turned off essentially the, the melanin production. Great, very interesting. Um, now you mentioned very briefly, there are, none of us are really um, uh, the same, right? In terms of our genome, just because our we have we all have our very different mutations in our genes. Now, because of that, um, how do you deal with the different mutations that you have? Maybe even in one gene and how they interact with each other. And you can also, I I think, uh, cross interactions between mutations in different genes that then uh, interact with each other and maybe negate themselves out or something like that. How do you determine that and how do you deal with that? So if you have a mutation in gene one and, uh, you know, that may be a negative effect, but then if you have a mutation in gene two that has a positive effect and kind of gets rid of the negative effect. <laughs> yeah, that's actually um, a very interesting question because it relates to this idea of epistasis. Um, so epistasis in genetics is when uh, multiple uh, locations in our genome interact with one another, and that can actually happen. Um, it's a very complex uh, phenomenon that we, uh, we really don't know much about. So at this point in time, what a lot of researchers are just trying to do is understand what single genes are doing. But it's a very good question, what happens, uh, uh, different uh, mutations in different genes can cancel each other out. And it really depends on the genetic background in which they arise. So all of the other genes in our genome and all of our other mutations. And so um, unfortunately, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know either yet. Yeah. But it's, it's a good one. Something for the future. Yeah. Uh, related to that, though, you know, there's a question, are there uh, genes that tend to be inherited together or are they most independent, mostly independent? Yeah, so uh, another, um, yeah, so this is a concept that I didn't, I didn't cover, but it turns out that, yes, a lot of genes are inherited together. Um, and uh, these are called linked genes or linked regions of our genomes. And they're inherited together often because they're uh, next to each other in the genome. And so, of course, these types of things uh, need to be accounted for when inferring um, uh, the changes that are occurring over time and in our ancestry. So if you've uh, looked at uh, your 23andMe or your Ancestry.com results, you may see that um, individuals, uh, that you, they have specific haplotypes. And those haplotypes are essentially representing the regions that are inherited together. And that actually leads me to my next question. So Ancestry.com and, and vendors like that have been, have been very pop popular recently, right? Um, and you get, uh, uh, my, my in-laws have done it, and you get like your repertoire of what your heritage is. You have so and so many percent from uh, whichever background. And uh, so how is that actually done? How do these companies determine what your uh, uh, ethnic and, and racial uh, heritages. Yeah, so, so what they do is um, we know a lot about um, different populations across the world and um, how they migrated over time. And so what we can do is we can use uh, the, those migration patterns to essentially construct a uh, phylogenetic tree relating all the different populations by uh, when uh, they, they uh, moved into different regions of the world. And then once we do that, we know the relationships among the different populations across the world. And then we can do the same thing that we just that I just discussed, which is trace back those mutations and trace back in particular those haplotypes over time and see what proportions of uh, each of each part of your genome are due to different ancestries. Great, thank you. Um, 
Another question is related to our environment. How do environmental factors uh, lead to mutation or impact our uh, genetic makeup over time? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I didn't mention environment at all. Um, I, I tried to be very careful in saying that genes control many of our traits. I also didn't talk about behavioral traits, which are, are, are it's unclear how much is caused by genetics, how much by environment. But also environment in general can introduce mutations. So for example, UV uh, rays can introduce mutations in our skin and that can, and, and other uh, different uh, types of radiation in particular can introduce mutations in our bodies in different regions. And so um, those can also uh, be passed on. And so it's not only the replication process that I mentioned, but it's also these external factors from the environment. Right, and then UV light uh, can, for example, cause skin cancer through these type of things. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one other question here is you mentioned machine learning and using the computer really in biological processes or, or identifying bio biological processes. Uh, can you give a specific example how machine learning might be used to predict gene function? Um, yeah, so there is a, uh, so, uh, so uh, there's another group um, that was uh, at Penn State before I left. They, they just uh, joined and what they were doing was actually uh, using uh, different uh, human populations and using information from different human populations and different species um, to build these um, machine learning models which take out features from the genome. So for example, as I was saying, uh, mutational footprint of um, uh, deleterious or harmful mutations is that they'll tend to result in less genetic change over time. And so if you look for regions specific, if you calculate um, the amount of, uh, of genetic change in each region of the genome over time by using uh, these different populations and these different species, you can get these statistics, um, those of uh, evolutionary change, um, or, uh, and you can get these, you can extract these footprints and these footprints can then be used as features and then you can then predict um, how harmful a particular mutation is or, or uh, what type of function um, a, a gene has. And so that's uh, a Dr. Yifei Huang's lab at Penn State. They're developing these uh, machine learning approaches specifically for that problem. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned your study with the Finnish, Italian, and UK population on the vitamin D receptor. Now, how quickly does these, do these type of adaptation typically take place? Like, let's say a Finnish uh, person with that kind of genome that has the increase in vitamin D receptor would move to Florida, and really the increase in vitamin D receptor is not that needed anymore. How quickly would that change from a genomic standpoint? Um, so, so that's a good question. Um, mutations arise in individuals. Um, so, um, for example, I can have a mutation that maybe nobody else has. But, uh, but evolutionary change, um, even within populations, happens over a long period of time. And so what we're looking at in that particular study is we're looking at the, the uh, RNA sequencing data across many individuals, um, often hundreds or thousands of individuals within each population. And we're trying to extract uh, these uh, footprints of events that have occurred in a majority or in a large proportion of them. So um, it's so if, if for example, um, someone moves to Florida and uh, doesn't need that uh, activity anymore, um, it's not going to change um, in that individual, and that that individual still has that mutation or, or set of mutations that cause that trait. Um, but it might happen over a longer period of time, over many generations. Okay, very interesting. Um, so you mentioned RNA expression and its molecular function in, in each cell and tissue or organs. The question here is, what is most significant to explore, RNA expression or protein expression? Um, yeah, <laughs> so that, that's another good one. Um, so um, there, there is an incomplete uh, relationship between the amount of RNA you produce and the amount of protein. So it's, it accounts for, I believe, um, there was a study that showed about 80%. So there is a strong relationship there. Um, however, it's not perfect. Um, 
The issue with looking at proteins um, and, and how they're uh, functioning is that it's a lot more complex of a problem. Um, so proteins, like I said, RNA is a linear molecule. It's just a sequence. And you can calculate the abundance um, or the amount of it uh, very easily. Well, not, not very easily, but uh, fairly easily in comparison to a protein. Um, another thing with protein that I mentioned that it's initially uh, translated into a linear molecule and then it folds up into this uh, three-dimensional conformation that allows it to perform functions. So there's a lot of complexity within that. So not only does it have to have the correct sequence, but it also has to fold properly. And so we need to be able um, to account for a lot of the complexity of proteins when we're studying them. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I, we mentioned very briefly cancer mutations and you mentioned the P53 mutations. Um, are individuals born with these cancer causing gene mutations or do these mutations happen over time? Um, the answer to that is both. Um, so um, many mutations that we have, we are born with, we get them from our parents. Um, and other mutations we can get from our environment. So if we're exposed to radiation, for example, um, there are several examples of that um, in human history where individuals, like a large population, was exposed to radiation um, at a particular location, and uh, a lot of them ended up developing cancer. So we can acquire mutations over our lifespan, or we can get them from our parents. Any difference in how cancer develops? Do you know that? I know you're not in cancer, but uh, if you have a, 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 uh, an, an inherited mutation that's potentially cancer causing or a mutation that is uh, uh, accumulated over your lifetime? Um, that's, that's a good question. So it's, uh, there's a, there, the, yeah, the, that's referring to, so, uh, we have pre, some pre-existing mutations that are coming from our parents, others that are de novo or arrive, arise because of uh, these external factors. And I'm not specifically a cancer researcher, so I don't know if there has been anything that's been found, the differences between those two. Um, so I'm not gonna hypothesize, but it is a really good question and, and something that definitely I'm sure people are working on. Maybe more in more general terms, and several of our questions here uh, are related to that. Um, how can can genetics and genomics, like the analyses that you're doing, help with identifying uh, disease causing mutations and then find solutions for potential cures or at least uh, treatments? That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of uh, the work that I've been, I've been doing is looking for these mutational signatures um, that are telling me about whether a gene is involved in a disease or whether it's adaptive. Um, however, um, to really get at understanding how to fix that problem, how to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with that, um, it requires a lot of different types of experiments. So my group is uh, primarily computational. And we're, so what we're trying to do is to predict these candidate genes. And then once we have these candidate genes, then, then hopefully other researchers will use our, our um, findings um, so that they can study them in more depth um, within actual human cells, within other animals, and eventually within humans one day. Great. Um, one specific question that was posted here, will your research uh, aid Alzheimer's or bring Alzheimer's solutions? Um, so yes, uh, Alzheimer's is a very uh, complex disease. We don't really know, um, we don't really know uh, the exact uh, genetic or molecular, uh, uh, molecular mechanisms just yet. Um, it can help, of course, you know, if, if I'm looking at these mutational signatures, there's no, um, I'm not limiting to any type of disease, so I'm not limiting to cancer or to Alzheimer's, I'm just looking for important genes and important mutations. And so um, it can help, but ultimately, again, it's, it's up to others to take the findings and uh, translate those into other types of studies within animals and to understand them better. Right. Um, one question that I think that came up uh, a while back when genetics and genomic um, analyses were first introduced was the uh, um, dangers behind it, if you like. Um, you can now determine if an individual has a predisposition to a certain disease, as you already mentioned. 
And um, the question here is, would insurance companies use the, this data in order to, you know, uh, have uh, negative effects for those that are born with these predispositions to certain uh, diseases? Yeah, that, that's actually a very important point. Um, and it's starting to become more and more important as these, especially as these companies, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com are, are collecting your data. How are this data shared? Um, do you even want to share the data with your, with your doctor or with other people? Um, and I honestly, I don't know where this is going. Um, personally, I, I, when 23andMe first came out with their uh, chip, um, I, th I think back in 2006 or so, I was one of the first people to sign up when, when the price went down to $100 because I was really excited to get my data and look at my results. But on the other hand, I, I understand that there is, uh, it's, it's a risk um, and we don't really know much about it. There's going to probably have to be a lot of uh, the laws that are going to be created around those data and how to control those. And it is my understanding that originally um, there were already some um, laws created that insurance companies cannot just uh, use these predisposing uh, conditions that somebody may have, but that might be a question for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming back to the question here that was posed earlier in the RNA versus the protein. Um, so the individual is still uh, looking at RNA is, is like a, a transition molecule, if you like, right? It goes from DNA to RNA to protein, while the protein is really the one that uh, usually affects a function. So the question is really more, um, if you would elaborate more on why we would want to learn more about the different organ RNA levels, then it would be better to look at the proteins who really have the function, right, that they are... Um, having on, on whatever uh, pathway they're walking on. Yeah, um, so this gets back uh, to uh, the, a previous question um, in that it's a lot more uh, complex to look at a protein molecule and its functionality than it is to look at RNA just because we can sequence RNA. Um, and there's also, like I was saying earlier, there's a high correlation or a high relationship between the amount of RNA that you're producing and the amount of uh, resulting protein in that cell. Um, and so the reason that I like, uh, that my group likes looking at RNA and, and a lot of other groups is because we can sequence uh, these RNAs uh, very quickly, uh, very cheaply, um, and understand a lot of things uh, that would take a lot more money, a lot more time in particular, and, uh, and, and a lot more complex uh, computational methods to understand with proteins. Yeah, so it, it has to do with the ease of uh, the essays, I guess, right? Um, yeah. Is, and the ease of interpretation. Yeah. Is there any prediction on how often you might be wrong in, in, in a sense, you know, when you're interpreting RNA data, because that all affects the folding of proteins in, in addition to functionality that may not be able to be predicted precisely. Um, do you have any sense for what the error rate is, so to speak, if you're looking at RNA versus protein? Um, I don't know what what the actual error rate is or if it's been studied. I do know that there's a high relationship, um, so about 80% um, between the actual levels of the RNA and the protein. I don't know how that translates into the protein folding correctly or performing its function correctly within the cell. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, and it's often dealt with um, a little bit indirectly. So what we do is rather than sequencing, um, getting the RNA sequencing data from one individual, we get RNA sequencing data from multiple individuals. Um, and then what we try to do is we use uh, some statistical approaches to correct for some of the issues that may arise, um, some of the biases like the experimental or technical biases that may arise. Um, so what we're getting in the end with RNA sequencing data is kind of an average um, effect across multiple individuals that's corrected for lots of these biases. Great. All right, we have time for one more question. This one is related to big data and anal analysis and complexities as one of the problems that need to be addressed in bioinformatics or computa computational biology. 
what advice will you give a graduate student who's interested in applying this knowledge in their research and what computer programming language should they learn? Um, okay, so, so advice. Um, I think it's a very, uh, it's a great field to be going into, uh, big data analysis, uh, data science. Um, uh, so those types of certificates and those types of degrees are going to become increasingly more important over time. Um, and, uh, and for specific programming languages, I would suggest uh, um, my group uses mostly Python and R. Um, so Python is um, the primary language. Um, however, there's R for statistical, it's, it's a very nice statistical language, so you can do uh, statistical programming uh, much more easily in R, I think, than in Python. So if you look at um, data scientist uh, positions, uh, you know, job postings, things like that, you might see uh, kind of what types of skills you would need. Um, but often they'll say Python and R or some, you know, maybe even some other languages as well. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Aziz. Uh, we will be posting this recording. Uh, the recording of the presentation on our website, uh, Research in Action at FAU. And also, uh, we didn't go, go through all of the questions that are there. We will ask Dr. Aziz to answer the remaining questions offline, and we will post the answers also together with the presentation. With that, we hope to see you again next week, and I uh, hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye.